first color squadron enters the forecourt. on parade are the central band of the Royal Air Force, the band of the RAF College Cranwell, the RAF Western Band and the Royal Artillery Band. Contingents of the Royal Australian and Royal New Zealand Air Forces escort their respective Queen's colours and the Royal Canadian Air Force is escorting number 401 Squadron Standard remembered as number one fighter squadron RCAF in the Battle of Britain. Unarmed flights and contingents represent the other service and civilian arms significant in the battle. There are 600 veterans and their relatives here from the Commonwealth and overseas and by no means least amongst them those gallant fighters from Poland and Czechoslovakia who escaped to continue their defiance after their own countries had been overrun. This then the scene which awaits the arrival of Her Majesty the Queen and members of the royal family on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. With the Queen, Prince Philip, his uniform that of Marshal of the Royal Air Force. Princess Margaret and the Duchess of York Prince and Princess Michael of Kent, the Duke and Duchess of Kent, Princess Alexandra and her husband, their majesties, the King and Queen of the Belgians, King Baudouin and Queen Fabiola, and Prince Bernhardt and Princess Juliana of the Netherlands. And so the scene is set for the fly past. 168 aircraft in close formation equaling the number in the Queen's coronation flybars.
Prime Minister, members of the government and opposition, a very distinguished gathering indeed in the VIP gallery. And so we await the largest flypast seen over London since the Second World War. It consists of seven separate formations, each formation of up to four distinct elements, several of disparate aircraft types, and of the 71 accredited squadrons which served under fighter command during the Battle of Britain, all still flying fixed-wing aircraft are represented today, and that's 32 squadrons in all, plus the Red Arrows and the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. And theirs is the honor of the lead. There are five Spitfires and two Hurricanes led by the Air Officer Commanding Number 11 Group, Air Vice Marshal Bill Ratton, today's successor to that great New Zealander Keith Park, who commanded the group in 1940. Bill Ratton then in the leading and oldest Spitfire, it's a Mark II, the two Hurricanes abreast, behind him the Spitz outboard. Speed 180 knots, altitude 500 feet, and looking up at this formation with critical, if perhaps slightly moist eyes, some of those who flew those aircraft as the first of the few. And now closing their one minute gap at 210 knots and 2,000 feet, three big VC-10s from Bryce Norton, numbers 10 and 101 squadrons, and on their wingtips two tornadoes of 13 squadron from Honington. They're used to that, tornadoes routinely refuel in flight from VC-10 tankers. Next, the workhorses, four Hercules of 242 ACU Lynam, led by the CO Wing Commander Pete Bedford. The Lossiemouth Maritime Element, two Buccaneers of 12 Squadron flank the lead Nimrod, two more from 208 Squadron on the second. Now, a mixed bag, four Canberras from 331 at Witten, and two BAE 125s from 32 Squadron of Norfolk, the government communication flight. And the executive jets not easy to hold in formation with the world's first operational jet bomber, as the Duke of Edinburgh and the Chief of the Air Staff will observe. A planned 40-second gap, and then formation number three. At 360 knots, the fighters. First 16 tornadoes thundering in from Coningsby. Four boxes of four in a box of boxes, and it doesn't do to feel claustrophobic in the middle of that little lot. 229 and OCU, 65 and 29 squadrons. The last box just back from the Gulf. Then the fighter trainers, 16 Hawks from Brody and Chivener in four squadrons, 79, 63, 2, 3, 4, 1, 5, 1. And then 16 more Tornado F3s from Leaning, led by 25. Then Treble 1, the Great Black Arrows, 43 and 29 squadrons to starboard and in the dead. And finally, the Phantom, 16 again from Lucas, Wattisham and Fildenrath, five squadrons there, 64, 92, 19, 74 and 56. The Phantoms being replaced by tornadoes, but still very much in frontline service. the fourth formation, the strike aircraft. First 16 tornado GR1s from Aria Bruggen and Larbrook in Germany, 17 and 16 squadron. Next the Harriers, 12 GR5s led by number three from Gutterslow and one and two, three, three from Wittering. 
and from the fleet air arm for Sea Harriers from 899 at Yeovilton. Amongst them, squadron leader Jeff Glover shot down in the Falklands War. Then the Honington Tornadoes and then the Jaguars from Coltishaw. And now, 50 seconds behind the Jaguars and closing down to 1,000 feet, the Red Arrows and their Hawks approaching the triumphant end of a particularly distinguished and busy season. Here's a sensational view as we go aboard the Lancaster. Squadron leader Colin Patterson, uh, the officer in charge of the flight in every sense, and his co-pilot squadron leader Mike Chatterton at 750 feet, symbolically alone. It's four Merlins growling in at 150 knots. The memorial flight's pride and joy is City of Lincoln, representing the epic deeds of Bomber Command in the battle and throughout the war, described by that great man of British aviation, Sir George Edwards, as an aircraft designed by engineers and built by craftsmen and women for heroes to fly. And finally, having cut back from the lead to conclude the fly past, the Spitfire and Hurricane, flown by the AOC 11 Group and the station commander at Coningsby. And here they come to salute Her Majesty in the time-honored style of the fighter pilot. And so, after those moments of intense excitement, Her Majesty and the Duke of Edinburgh, escorted by the Chief of the Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Sir Peter Harding, now leave the balcony and descend to the palace forecourt for the traditional inspection of the Royal Guard of Honour, followed by a review from the palace Range Rover of all the units and contingents on parade. The armed flights with their colors and standards and their escorts occupy center stage. The Royal Auxiliary Air Force with its Queen's color. The right front markers are 43 and 41 squadrons, which flew Hurricanes and Spitfires respectively, now equipped with Tornado F3s and Jaguars at Lucas and Coltishaw. The great five and six hundreds represented by the auxiliaries, for example, their friendly rivals 602 and 603 of Glasgow and Edinburgh, who later I knew well. The Royal Artillery Band here with its old comrades association in token of the hundreds of anti-aircraft guns and searchlights whose crews, both men and women in many cases, spent days on end without leaving their gun pits. 
And beside that group, the New Zealanders, with their Queen's colour, presented by Her Majesty in 1953, since then never before today paraded other than within its native shores. And note, the New Zealand WAFs are armed. And on the far flank, the Royal Australian Air Force, still distinctive in their darker blue uniform, parade their Queen's colour. And to the left of centre, the Royal Canadian Air Force, with the squadron standard of what was their number one squadron, RCAF, which flew hurricanes. The Chief of the Air Staff escorts Her Majesty from the Privy Purse door. The Royal Guard of Honour drawn up across the centre of the forecourt, found by the corps d'elite of the Royal Air Force on the ground. Its CO squadron leader, Roger Booth, leads to the Queen the fact that it is ready for her inspection. And at this point, we hear a piece of music specially commissioned for the occasion. Wing Commander Barry Hingley, their Senior Director of Music, conducts the Royal Air Force Bands in the first public performance of Ron Goodwin's the 15th of September. Queen's Colour Squadron, familiar, of course, with great occasions. But surely no parade even they have ever mounted has presented moments more proud than this, as the Sovereign acknowledges her colour, of which they are the custodians, on this historic day. And further to mark this 50th anniversary, the squadron is mounting the Palace Guard for the current period of duty. Section of the Royal Guard of Honour concluded, Her Majesty will now review the remainder of the parade. Parade Commander Group Captain Joe French joins the Chief of the Air Staff in attendance and His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh is escorted by Wing Commander Peter Storey. representatives of the Royal Air Forces Association. Air Vice Marshal Sir uh, uh, Ivor Broom is the right marker, Group Captain the Right Honourable the Earl of Ilchester the left, its national standard in the centre. Together with the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund, the association cares for members of the service family in need and need their and our support. Next, the Royal Observer Corps with their banner 
whose outposts supplemented the radar reports of enemy aircraft. Next to them, the RAF Volunteer Reserve, which provided countless aircrew during and after the battle. Numbers one and three squadrons, number one the oldest formed in 1878 with balloons. The Royal Australian Air Force with its Queen's colour behind it, 56 and treble one squadrons. Then 17, 19, 54 and 74 all Spitfire and Hurricane squadrons. The Royal Canadian Air Force whose air crew served on so many squadrons as well as their own. 23 and 25, both flew Blenheims, now Tornadoes. The Royal New Zealand Air Force, an astonishing number of New Zealands, distinguished themselves from Keith Park to Sheep Gilroy and Pathfinder Bennett and many others. 29, another Blenheim squadron is reviewed. 32, now based at Norfolk, the last Battle of Britain airfield still operation, and behind them 72 and 85. The Royal Auxiliary Air Force, the legendary and heroic amateurs, and behind them, the representatives of the civilian services. And now the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh drive back for what will be for many an unforgettable experience. <coughs> to the far right of the palace forecourt are assembled several hundred veterans of the Battle of Britain and their relatives. Men and women of that broad diversity of background and experience who were in 1940 as they are today the people of Britain. It is the kind of occasion from which we know both the Queen and the Duke derive as much pleasure as they bestow. It will be, if you will, a recollection of the visits made by the Queen's parents to airfields and squadrons, control rooms, hospitals and bomb sites at a time when the British people were probably more united than at any time in their history. Her Majesty is welcomed by Air Chief Marshal Sir Christopher Foxley Norris, Chairman of the Battle of Britain Fighter Association, arguably the world's most exclusive and distinguished club. And its indefatigable secretary, Wing Commander Pat Hancock, stands alongside the chairman. And so memories are recalled and no doubt exchanged. But like all epic events, the facts of the Battle of Britain have become clouded in mythology. Typically, Sir Christopher Foxley Norris has cogent comment on the subject. It is interesting that if you went up to the average man in the street and said, do you know anything about the Battle of Britain? And he'd say, oh yes, a few dashing young English officers flying Spitfires <coughs> defeated the Germans. They weren't as few as all that, you know. People are very surprised, but there were nearly 3,000 of our people in the battle. Not at the same time, never more than about 700 at one time, but 3,000 actually qualified. If they were dashing, they didn't last very long. They weren't all young, by any means. A lot of them were, of course, but people like Douglas Bader, Salem Milan, well over 30, and some of the Poles and Czechs were over 40. By no means all officers. People forget that one third of the pilots in the Battle of Britain were NCOs. And in fact, some of the air crew in the fighter Blenheims and Defiance weren't even NCOs, they were airmen. And they weren't flying Spitfires. Two thirds of the aircraft flying were Hurricanes. Everybody's heard of the Spitfires. 
So dashing young officers and so on and so on, that's a 100% inaccurate statement. <coughs> Sir Christopher Fox Norris expressing the wit shared by all his colleagues amongst this group of very, very distinguished veterans, the company of whom Her Majesty is obviously enjoying. But even on royal occasions, in gatherings such as this, airmen talk inevitably of aeroplanes. How did you compare the Spitfire with the Hurricane? The Spitfire, as we all know, was faster, sleek looking airplane, a beautiful airplane to fly. The Hurricane was heavier, a little slower, but of course could outturn the Spitfire and the 109. A superb gun platform, the Hurricane, could absorb a great deal of punishment. And I knew that because my airplanes seemed to get hit rather more often than I hit the Germans at that stage. The 109, we found, could outclimb us. It was faster than us, but she could never outturn us and it was turning that mattered in that sort of war. Uh, the Hurricane was rock stable, quite easy to fly, not as fast as the 109, but in every other respect it was fully up to the job. You couldn't run away quite as quickly as you might like if you wanted to, and equally if uh, 109 ran away from you, you couldn't catch it up. Uh, I was hit in, uh, in France earlier on, before the Battle of Britain, and the Hurricane just shrugged off the bullets through the fabric uh, which was a, a great advantage over an all-metal uh, construction. But uh, the ladies and gentlemen whom Her Majesty is meeting were by no means all air crew. To talk to any ex-pilot about the Battle of Britain and he will pay tribute to the ground crews. They too are, of course, included in this distinguished gathering. How did you enjoy taking care of a Spitfire? Very much. You know, it, it was a, an intriguing challenge. You, you never knew what you were going to find any time an aircraft came back. And to get them ready in the mornings, uh, and between sorties, for another sortie, was really a test of one's skill. Obviously, you were looking for battle damage every time it landed. Not only for battle damage, but the correct functioning of all the controls. The elevators, the flaps, uh, checking over the undercarriage to make sure there was no hydraulic leaks anywhere, looking in the cockpit and waggling the stick about, lowering the flaps, looking at the tires. You were there when Hornchurch was attacked? Indeed, yes, and it was severely bombed on several occasions, both during the daytime and at night. And, uh, of course, everybody had to go down into the air raid shelters. To, uh, otherwise, you know, if you were killed, well, you were one of them and less. After the airfield had been bombed, did you, as a rigger, help filling in the holes? Oh, yes, too true. Uh, ha having got your aircraft serviceable, th th then, then you went out and filled in the holes. And, I mean, often aircraft would come back and just land, uh, stop on the airfield, it was a grass airfield, and they'd run out of fuel. So then, uh, w on occasions, one would jump in a gary, take, take the lorry out, earn some rope, and pull it off the field. Oh, and there quite often times I was driving this powers of, uh, full of fuel around, with bombs dropping all around. But uh, I was doing no more than all the rest of were working out there, you see. Uh, I d you don't... I don't quite know how to put it, because you didn't realise what was going on. You was busy. Sometimes you waited and they didn't come back. Sometimes your plane came back but you saw others waiting and theirs didn't come back. Fortunately, although planes didn't come back, quite often pilots did. In fact, uh, at one time, we was passing Elm Park Underground Station and two of our pilots came out, out of the station with their parachutes tucked under their arm. They'd come back from the shorty by underground. We knew, for a start, that uh, we're fighting for our life. Not individually, the country was fighting for its life. And uh, that plane had to be got up as soon as possible, and that's just, just what we did.
The Chief of the Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Sir Peter Harding, accompanying the Queen and also having much to recall himself as he chats with the veterans. And amongst them a group of Australians who last night uh, were taken to a party by London taxi drivers who refused to accept their fare when they discovered who their clients were. Polite conversation and many an amusing tale to be told. But what did it really feel like to be a pilot in the Battle of Britain? How did you feel when you saw your first enemy airplane? Very confused. We went into a crowd of bombers uh, and it was just chaos as far as I was concerned. Um, I did all the right things, I think. I sort of uh, put the gun button on to fire. I <laughs> I uh, pressed the thing at the right time. Whether I hit anything, goodness only knows. But uh, that was it. And, uh, well, of course, if you had any sense, you didn't hang around after that. Can you remember what you felt when you saw your first 109? Oh, you know, for, for chaps like m me, we were all the same. Um, uh, it was terribly exciting. Really terribly exciting. It must have occurred to you that you might be the next to be killed. Oh yes, the thought certainly did cross my mind more than once, yes. But it didn't bother you unduly? No, it didn't. I think the time when one was really apprehensive was coming down to the airfield just at dawn or just before dawn and you could smell the new mown grass on the airfield, you know, and you wondered if it was going to be, you'd see the next morning. Yes, yes. These thoughts certainly cross one's mind, naturally. I don't think it was typical, but there was, in fact, a factual occasion, as it might be, this mess we're standing in front of now. It was at Croydon, I believe. Two young pilots turned up in a motor car, greeted by the CO, come on, word readiness, off you go. And they went up, and they were both killed, and the car was left there. That was their sole participation. It lasted perhaps less than an hour. You lost a lot of friends. I did. We had, we lost ten pilots on the squadron in the two months. All good friends. Some I'd known for several months in the squadron. Some joined us. We met for a week and then they'd gone. It was, it was that sort of thing. Others stayed on. How did you feel about the Germans? Uh, I've been asked this question since the war on many occasions and I think in our youth we looked upon this as a job to do. I don't think we ever thought of the individual in the aircraft at all. It was an enemy airplane to be shot at. It's very hard for the average youngster today to realise that the quiet old man he sees was a very angry young man in 1940 because we hadn't asked these Germans to come over and bomb our folk. They were doing it. I mean, it's all very well to compare a place like Coventry with Dresden or something. But um, bear in mind this fact that you'd be surprised how much aggression would be generated from within the average man. If, he, if your mother, in my case, was being bombed by a lot of people who you had, hadn't asked to come and do it. And you, you began to be a very tough young man. What do you reckon was your closest call? Well, I had several. Uh, um, I was foolish enough to stay up alone when I should have come home. And uh, I found myself uh, at the end of what I thought was a loose line of about 27 Messerschmitts. And I had, uh, I think there's a Walter Mitty in all of us, and I envisaged myself working down the line, and I'd forgotten number 28, who got me, and uh, I was very badly shot up indeed. Did you bail out? No, no, I was able to get it back, but uh, as I landed, the rudder controls went completely. Where did you land? I landed back at Biggin Hill. Oh, really? Yeah. Wheels up? Oh, no, got the wheels, wheels down, up. yes. Couldn't oh, operate right. the flaps, and my port aileron had been blown off, and my canopy had gone, and my rear view mirror, and big holes in the airplane all over the place. Yes, you must have been a bit twitched by that one. I was uh, a bit upset by it, yes. Did you think that some of the British pilots took the whole thing a bit casually? Well, I, I wouldn't say casually, but a little bit differently. Uh, 
When we came here, we had sort of uh, experience of uh, dealing with Germans, and uh, although we didn't uh, mind uh, Germans, we hated Germany. Some treat it as a sort of a sporting event, <laughs> usually, especially auxiliary ones. There are quite a number of them, uh, but uh, I had, uh, I was. Uh, lucky to be with Paddy Finnegan in the same squadron for uh, in '65, and he took it very seriously. And we had a long chat with him, and he told me, "Look, Ski, uh, there never must be another war because that doesn't solve problem." And I entirely agreed. And I said to him, "Yes, but let's have Holland free first. Fifty years ago, these young men were caught up on the relentless tide of history. But did they realize it at the time? Did you ever have any doubts about the issue? I, we never thought we'd be beaten. And I, I think we thought it might have gone on a bit longer. But the Battle of Britain as such, it stopped. We didn't win anything. I uh, don't think we won any battle. But we did buy time, a little valuable time, which enabled our bomber command to get geared up, it enabled the army to start getting to grips, enabled the navies to get going. If we hadn't won that air battle, don't forget it's the only time in history two air fleets have ever met each other when the change of a whole war happened. If we'd lost that air battle, I think you could have said the world would be a different place today. What about you yourself? Were you confident of victory? I think, yes, I think we were. I, I think in those days, uh, there was a lot of red on the map, wasn't there? There was a British Empire and so on, and uh, ignorance, arrogance, call it what you like. Although things were rough, things were bad, I don't think anyone ever thought we'd lose. <laughs> the Battle of Britain was just as important as the Battle of Waterloo and the Battle of Trafalgar and indeed uh, of the fight against the Spanish Armada in that it saved this country from invasion and had we lost that uh, God knows what, we'd, what sort of a state we'd be in today. Did you realize that it was a very important phase, the Battle of Britain? At the time, I no, and I don't think most of us realized how important this was and as it's proved in the event if we'd have lost that battle that would have been the end of the war as far as we were concerned there wouldn't have been any montgomery's or or uh, eisenhower's or anybody that was the end were you ever in doubt about the outcome no strangely enough we had one had no idea how we were going to win the war of course but uh, there's one thing we were all convinced about was that we weren't going to lose it. Yes. That would be the next phase, winning it. Yes. Thus, the recollections being exchanged. The Duke of Edinburgh himself, of course, an airman in every sense of the word, enjoying the conversation with the Polish veteran from whom we just heard. But I think the time is approaching when, reluctantly perhaps, Her Majesty must leave her friends in that enclosure to continue the formalities of the parade. And so the Queen and Prince Philip, escorted by Sir Peter Harding and the Air Equerry, Wing Commander David Walker, proceed to the saluting base in the center gate of the palace in readiness for the march past. Meantime, as you see, the forecourt and the entrance to the palace a few moments ago so crowded is now vacant because the parade has withdrawn to the side in order to reform for the march past as spectacular as anything which we have seen so far today.
The Queen approaches the podium on which she will stand alone, the focal point of these thousands of eyes gathered on this brilliant summer morning here in London. Sir Peter Harding on the Queen's left, the Aquari behind, the Duke of Edinburgh to her right. The Queen looking to her left, from which she knows she will catch her first glimpse of what will be one of the most moving and proud moments of this entire occasion. And there it is, the lone and direct figure of Air Chief Marshal Sir Christopher Foxley Norris, Chairman of the Battle of Britain Fighter Association, followed by its Honorary Secretary, Wing Commander Pat Hancock, leads the marching contingent of veterans of the Battle of Britain, which in turn and alone leads the entire parade. Sir Christopher, a truly great chap, swept into the very start of the war from Oxford University Air Squadron, flew Lysanders in France, escaped near Dunkirk, went on to a brilliant service career and subsequently in business. Chairman for many years of the Leonard Cheshire Foundation, as modest, witty and entertaining a companion as one could ever meet. Behind him, those of his kind, who a half century ago performed great deeds, though they will deny it, but who are proud and thankful to be here today, and that they will not deny. Moments never to be forgotten, not only by those whom we have just seen march past, but all those who watched and mentally at least saluted them. And now the parade commander, Group Captain Joe French, leads the march past of the squadron's contingents and units already reviewed by Her Majesty. Headed by their colors and standards and their escorts in a royal salute to the sovereign from the Royal Air Force of today and of 50 years ago.
And finally, the unarmed flights, the women's Royal Air Forces. And finally, behind them, what is described as the representatives contingent, all those organizations other than the Royal Air Force themselves, invited here in recognition of the part they played in the national effort. For example, the police, the ambulance service and the firemen, the Coastal Forces Veterans Association, the Salvation Army, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, who rescued so many downed airmen, and the tra Air Transport Auxiliary, who ferried in the replacement aircraft to the depleted squadrons. So this historic parade is dispersed, but the Royal Guard of Honour, the Queen's Colour Squadron, has reformed in the forecourt in readiness for the departure of Her Majesty. Thus ends a momentous occasion for the Royal Air Force, dedicated as it was to the most momentous period in its entire history. And dare one suppose that this great occasion may have won the approval even of those commanders of Iron Reserve, Lord Trenchard and Lord Dowding, without whom, as history reveals, the Battle of Britain may never even have been fought. Commentator was Raymond Baxter and television presentation was by David Pickthall. You can see highlights of this morning's event at five past five tomorrow on BBC One. Starting from 11 different airfields and flying at four different airspeeds. The fastest, the tornadoes and other fighters and bombers, are flying at 415 miles an hour the slowest at 160 miles an hour, and that's us in the Lancaster here. I'm sitting in the Lancaster wireless operator's position, behind the pilots and the navigator and the flight engineer. The 168 aircraft have been spread around East Anglia and North East London in eight different holding patterns, and because we are the slowest, we're closest, just over the Lee Valley between Enfield and Woodford. And from here, we've seen most of the other formations go by, when we leave here, we'll become second last, and as we run in, the red arrows will overtake us to arrive a minute ahead of us.
So I'll leave you to join the rest as we start our stately progress towards central London. Our thanks to Sean Maffitt and to the memorial flight for giving him and our camera a view beyond price. But we have even more unique air-to-air -air coverage for you. Flight Lieutenant Tam Hazan has been appointed to acting supernumerary BBC cameraman for the day aboard one of the Hawks from Brawley, now holding station in their rendezvous area and closing onto their position with a Nimrod and a pair of buccaneers. And an unusual spectacle for most people, three big airliners in formation, standard practice for the RAF's VC-10s. An impressive and very potent group indeed. 16 tornadoes capable of around the collective punch of the whole of 11 group in 1940. And from that era, the heroes of the hour, the Spitfires and Hurricanes, who will be first along the Mall today, all flown by the Battle of Britain Memorial Flights pilots who managed to squeeze this privileged job on top of their regular service duties. Back to the Hawks' eye view again as the formation gets on to the display heading over out of London. Now aboard the Lancaster over the Lee Valley Reservoirs, its holding area to join the main formation. And here's the bomb aimer's position, a view of the English landscape as seen by the Luftwaffe in 1940. But that turret of the Lancaster housed the same guns which aboard the Hurricanes and Spitfires barred Hitler's way to London, the achievement commemorated at Buckingham Palace today. Prime Minister, members of the government and opposition, a very distinguished gathering indeed in the VIP gallery. And so we await the largest flypast seen over London since the Second World War. It consists of seven separate formations, each formation of up to four distinct elements, several of disparate aircraft types, and of the 71 accredited squadrons which served under fighter command during the Battle of Britain, all still flying fixed wing aircraft are represented today and that's 32 squadrons in all plus the red arrows and the battle of britain memorial flight and theirs is the honor of the lead there are five spitfires and two hurricanes led by the air officer commanding number 11 group air vice marshal bill ratton today's successor to that great new zealander keith park who commanded the group in 1940. Bill Ratton then in the leading and oldest Spitfire, it's a Mark II, the two Hurricanes abreast, behind him the Spitz outboard. Speed 180 knots, altitude 500 feet, and looking up at this formation with critical, if perhaps slightly moist eyes, some of those who flew those aircraft as the first of the few. And now closing their one minute gap at 210 knots and 2,000 feet, three big VC-10s from Bryce Norton, numbers 10 and 101 squadrons, and on their wingtips two tornadoes of 13 squadron from Honington, and next the workhorses.
for Hercules of 242 OCU Lynham, led by the CO, Wing Commander Pete Bedford. The Lossiemouth Maritime Element, two Buccaneers of 12th Squadron flank the lead Nimrod, two more from 208 Squadron on the second. Executive jets not easy to hold in formation with the world's first operational jet bomber as the Duke of Edinburgh and the Chief of the Air Staff will observe. From the National Westminster Tower in the city 600 feet up, a preview of the view from the palace. A planned 40 second gap and then formation number three. At 360 knots, the fighters. First 16 tornadoes thundering in from Coningsby. Four boxes of four in a box of boxes. And it doesn't do to feel claustrophobic in the middle of that little lot. 229 and OCU, 65 and 29 squadrons. The last box just back from the Gulf. Then the fighter trainers, 16 Hawks from Brody and Chivener in four squadrons, 79, 63, 2, 3, 4, 1, 5, 1. And then 16 more Tornado F3s from Leaning, led by 25. Then Trevor 1, the Great Black Arrows, 43 and 29 squadrons to starboard and in the dead. And finally, the Phantom, 16 again from Lucas, Bottisham and Bildenrath. Five squadrons there, 64, 92, 19, 74 and 56. The Phantoms being replaced by tornadoes, but still very much in frontline service. And now, still far away at the tail of the flypast, from our camera in the Lancaster, a glimpse of the Red Arrows overtaking at more than twice the speed of the old bomber. Now the fourth formation, the strike aircraft. First 16 tornado GR1s from Aria Bruggen and Narbrook in Germany, 17 and 16 squadron. Next the Harriers, 12 GR5s led by number three from Gutterslow and one and two, three, three from Wittering. And from the fleet air on four sea harriers from 899 at Yeovilton. Amongst them, squadron leader Jeff Glover shot down in the Falklands War. Then the Honington tornadoes and then the Jaguars from Coltishaw. And now, 50 seconds behind the Jaguars and closing down to 1,000 feet, the Red Arrows and their Hawks approaching the triumphant end of a particularly distinguished and busy season. Here's a sensational view as we go aboard the Lancaster. Squadron leader Colin Patterson, uh, the officer in charge of the flight in every sense, and his co-pilot squadron leader Mike Chatterton at 750 feet, symbolically alone. It's four Merlins growling in at 150 knots. The memorial flight's pride and joy is City of Lincoln, representing the epic deeds of Bomber Command in the battle and throughout the war, described by that great man of British aviation, Sir George Edwards, as an aircraft designed by engineers and built by craftsmen and women for heroes to fly.
and finally having cut back from the lead to conclude the fly past the Spitfire and Hurricane flown by the AOC 11 group and the station commander at Coningsby and here they come to salute Her Majesty in the time-honored style of the fighter pilot. And after those moments of intense excitement, Her Majesty, attended by the Chief of the Air Staff and the Air Equerry, enter the forecourt, where squadron leader Roger Booth, commanding the Royal Guard of Honor, reports that it is ready for her inspection. The Queen's Colour Squadron, familiar, of course, with great occasions. But surely no parade even they have ever mounted has presented moments more pride than this as the Sovereign acknowledges her colour, of which they are the custodians on this historic day. And further to mark this 50th anniversary, the squadron is mounting the palace guard for the current period of duty. The inspection of the Royal Guard of Honor concluded, Her Majesty will now review the remainder of the parade. Parade Commander Group Captain Joe French joins the Chief of the Air Staff in attendance and His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh is escorted by Wing Commander Peter Storey. we hear music specially commissioned for the occasion. The first public performance of Ron Goodwin's the 15th of September. And the first flight to be reviewed represents the Royal Air Forces Association. An air marshal, no less, is the right-hand front marker, Sir Ivor Broome. The Royal Observer Corps, whose outpost supplemented the radar reports of enemy aircraft. The RAF Volunteer Reserve, which provided countless air crew during and after the battle. Numbers 1 and 3 squadrons, number 1 the oldest, formed in 1878 with balloons. The Royal Australian Air Force, with its Queen's colour, behind it 56 and treble 1. 17, 19, 54 and 74, all Spitfire and Hurricane squadrons. The Royal Canadian Air Force, whose air crews served on so many squadrons as well as their own. 23 and 25, both flew Blenheims, now Tornadoes. The Royal New Zealand Air Force, an astonishing number of New Zealanders, distinguished themselves from Keith Park to Sheep Gilroy and Pathfinder Bennett and many others. 29, another Blenheim squadron. 32, now based at Northolt, the last Battle of Britain airfield still operational. Behind them, 72 and 85. The Royal Auxiliary Air Force, the legendary and heroic amateurs. 41 and 43 squadrons against Spitfires and Hurricanes. The Provo, the SBs, and the Women's Royal Air Force. The youth of today, the ATC and the University Air Squadrons. And now, what will be for many an unforgettable experience. To the far right of the forecourt are assembled several hundred veterans of the battle and their relatives. Men and women of that broad diversity of background and experience who were in 1940 as they are today, the people of Britain. It is the kind of occasion from which we know both the Queen and the Duke derive as much pleasure as they bestow. It will be, if you will, 
a recollection of the visits made by the Queen's parents to airfields, squadrons, control rooms, hospitals and bomb sites at a time when the British people were probably never more united than at any time in their history. Her Majesty is welcomed by Air Chief Marshal Sir Christopher Foxley Norris, Chairman of the Battle of Britain Fighter Association, arguably the world's most exclusive and distinguished club. And its indefatigable secretary, Wing Commander Pat Hancock, stands alongside the chairman. And so memories are recalled and no doubt exchanged. But like all epic events, the facts of the Battle of Britain have become clouded in mythology. Typically, Sir Christopher Foxley Norris has cogent comment on the subject. It is interesting that if you went up to the average man in the street and said, do you know anything about the Battle of Britain? And he'd say, oh yes, a few dashing young English officers flying Spitfires <coughs> defeated the Germans. They weren't as few as all that, you know. People are very surprised, but there were nearly 3,000 uh, of our people in the battle. Not at the same time, never more than about 700 at one time, but 3,000 actually qualified. If they were dashing, <laughs> they didn't last very long. They weren't all young, by any means. <laughs> A lot of them were, of course, but people like Douglas Bader, Sailor Milan, well over 30, and some of the Poles and Czechs were over 40. By no means all officers. People forget that one third of the pilots in the Battle of Britain were NCOs, and in fact some of the air crew in the fighter Blenheims and Defiance weren't even NCOs, they were airmen. And they weren't flying Spitfires. Two thirds of the aircraft flying were Hurricanes. Everybody's heard of the Spitfires. So dashing young officers and so on and so on, that's a 100% inaccurate statement. Sir Christopher Foxley Norris expressing the wit shared by all his colleagues amongst this group of very, very distinguished veterans, the company of whom Her Majesty is obviously enjoying. But even on royal occasions, in gatherings such as this, airmen talk inevitably of aeroplanes. How did you compare the Spitfire with the Hurricane? The Spitfire, as we all know, was faster, sleek looking airplane, a beautiful airplane to fly. The Hurricane was heavier, a little slower, but of course could outturn the Spitfire and the 109. A superb gun platform, the Hurricane, could absorb a great deal of punishment. And I knew that because my airplane seemed to get hit rather more often than I hit the Germans at that stage. The 109 we found could outclimb us. It flew faster than us, but she could never outturn us. And it was turning that mattered in that sort of war. I was hit in, uh, in France earlier on, before the Battle of Britain, and the Hurricane just shrugged off the bullets through the fabric, uh, which was a, a great advantage over an all-metal uh, construction. Talk to any ex-pilot about the Battle of Britain, and he will pay tribute to the ground crews. They too are, of course, included in this distinguished gathering. Oh, and quite often times I was driving this power uh, full of fuel around with bombs dropping all around. But uh, I was doing no more than all the rest of were working out there, you see. Uh, I, d you don't, I don't quite know how to put it, because you didn't realise what was going on. You was busy. Sometimes you waited and they didn't come back. Sometimes your plane came back but you saw others waiting and theirs didn't come back. Fortunately, although planes didn't come back, quite often pilots did. In fact, uh, at one time, we was passing Elm Park Underground Station, and two of our pilots came out, out of the station with their parachutes tucked under their arm. They'd come back from the shorty by underground. We knew, for a start, that uh, we are fighting for our life. Not individually, the country was fighting for its life. And uh, that plane had to be got up as soon as possible, and that's just, just what we did. Polite conversation and many an amusing tale to be told. But what did it really feel like 
to be a pilot in the Battle of Britain. How did you feel when you saw your first enemy airplane? Very confused. We went into a crowd of bombers, uh, and it was just chaos as far as I was concerned. Um, I did all the right things, I think. I sort of uh, put the gun button on to fire. I, <laughs> I uh, pressed the thing at the right time. Whether I hit anything, goodness only knows. But uh, that was it. And, uh, well, of course, if you had any sense, you didn't hang around after that. Can you remember what you felt when you saw your first 109? Oh, you know, for, for chaps like m me, we were all the same. Um, uh, it was terribly exciting, really terribly exciting. It must have occurred to you that you might be the next to be killed. Oh, yes, the thought certainly did cross my mind <laughs> more than once, yes. But it didn't bother you unduly? No, it didn't. I think the time when one was really apprehensive was coming down to the airfield just at dawn or just before dawn, and you could smell the new mown grass on the airfield, you know, and you wondered if it was going to be, you'd see the next morning. Yes, yes. These thoughts certainly cross one's mind, naturally. I don't think it was typical, but there was, in fact, a factual occasion, as it might be, this mess we're standing in front of now. It was at Croydon, I believe. Two young pilots turned up in a motor car, greeted by the CEO, come on, word readiness, off you go. And they went up, and they were both killed, and the car was left there. That was their sole participation. It lasted perhaps less than an hour. What do you reckon was your closest call? Well, I had several. Uh, um, I was foolish enough to stay up alone when I should have come home. And uh, I found myself uh, at the end of what I thought was a loose line of about 27 Messerschmitts. And I had, uh, I think there's a Walter Mitty in all of us, and I envisaged myself working down the line, and I'd forgotten number 28, who got me, and uh, I was very badly shot up indeed. Did you bail out? No, no, I was able to get it back, but uh, as I landed, the rudder controls went completely. Where did you land? I landed back at Biggin Hill. Oh, really? Yes. Wheels up? Oh, no, got oh, the, the wheels, wheels down, up. yes. Couldn't yeah. operate the flaps, and my port aileron had been blown off, and my canopy had gone, and my rear-view mirror, and big holes in the airplane all over the place. Yes, you must have been a bit twitched by that one. I was uh, a bit upset by it, yes. Yeah. Did you think that some of the British pilots took the whole thing a bit casually? Well, I, w I wouldn't say casually, but a little bit differently. Uh, when we came here, we had sort of uh, experience of uh, dealing with Germans. And uh, although we didn't uh, mind uh, Germans, we hated Germany. Some treated it as a sort of a sporting event. <laughs> Would usually, especially auxiliary ones. There are quite a number of them. Uh, but uh, I had, uh, I was uh, lucky to be with Paddy Finnegan in the same squadron for uh, in '65, and he took it very seriously. And we had a long chat with him, and he told me, "Look, Ski, uh, there never must be another war." because that doesn't solve the problem. And I entirely agreed. And I said to him, yes, but let's have Holland free first. <laughs> Fifty years ago, these young men were caught up on the relentless tide of history. But did they realize it at the time? Did you ever have any doubts about the issue? I, we never thought we'd be beaten. And I, I think we thought it might have gone on a bit longer. But the Battle of Britain as such, it stopped. We didn't win anything. I uh, don't think we won any battle. But we did buy time, a little valuable time, which enabled our bomber command to get geared up, it enabled the army to start getting to grips, enabled the navies to get going. If we hadn't won that air battle, and don't forget it's the only time in history two air fleets have ever met each other when the change of a whole war happened. If we'd lost that air battle, I think you could have said the world would be a different place today. 
what about you yourself? Were you confident of victory? I think, yes, I think we were. I, I think in those days, uh, there was a lot of red on the map, wasn't there? There was a British Empire and so on, and ignorance, arrogance, call it what you like. Although things were rough, things were bad, I don't think anyone ever thought we'd lose. <laughs> the Battle of Britain was just as important as the Battle of Waterloo and the Battle of Trafalgar and indeed uh, of the fight against the Spanish Armada in that it saved this country from invasion. And had we lost that, uh, God knows what, we'd, what sort of a state we'd be in today. But I think the time is approaching when reluctantly perhaps Her Majesty must leave her friends in that enclosure to continue the formalities of the parade. And so the Queen and Prince Philip escorted by Sir Peter Harding and the Air Equerry, Wing Commander David Walker, proceed to the saluting base in the center gate of the palace in readiness for the march past. Sir Peter Harding on the Queen's left, the Aquarii behind the Duke of Edinburgh to her right. And now one of the most moving and proud moments of the entire occasion. The lone and erect figure of Air Chief Marshal Sir Christopher Foxley Norris, followed by Wing Commander Pat Hancock, leads the marching contingent of veterans of the battle which in turn and alone leads the entire parade. Sir Christopher, a truly great chap, swept into the very start of the war from Oxford University Air Squadron, flew Lysanders in France, escaped near Dunkirk, went on to a brilliant service career. Behind him, those of his kind who a half century ago performed great deeds, though they will deny it, but who are proud and thankful to be here today and that they will not deny. Commander, Group Captain Joe French, leads the march past of the squadron's contingents and units already reviewed by Her Majesty. Headed by their colors and standards and their escorts in a royal salute to the Sovereign from the Royal Air Force of today and of 50 years ago. the Women's Royal Air Force, the Nurses and the Royal Observer Corps, we will see what is described as the Representatives Contingent. 
all those organizations other than the Royal Air Forces themselves invited here in recognition of the part they played in the national effort. For example, the police, the ambulance service and the firemen, the Coastal Forces Veterans Association, the Salvation Army, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, who rescued so many downed airmen, and the Air Transport Auxiliary, who ferried in the replacement aircraft to the depleted squadrons. So this historic parade is dispersed. But the Royal Guard of Honor, the Queen's Color Squadron, has reformed in the forecourt in readiness for the departure of Her Majesty. Thus ends a momentous occasion for the Royal Air Force, dedicated as it was to the most momentous period in the entire history of the service. Dare one suppose that it may have won the approval even of those commanders of Iron Reserve, Lord Trenchard and Lord Diding, without whom, as history reveals, the Battle of Britain may never even have been fought. Thus then, the spectacular fly-past and parade at Buckingham Palace yesterday. But on the 15th of September 1940, the spectacle and the mood here at RAF Uxbridge in the control room of Number 11 Group Fighter Command could not have presented a more stark contrast. What you see now is precisely what Air Vice Marshal Keith Park, the group commander, saw as he looked down from the fighter controller's gallery. The plot on the map, constantly updated by the WAFs, showed the positions of the defending RAF squadrons as they climbed to intercept the vastly superior numbers of German fighters and bombers. At precisely 11.30, 92 squadron, the first to make contact, plunged into the attack. Purely by chance, Winston Churchill had just arrived on one of his many unheralded visits. A glance at the board which indicated the battle state of every squadron revealed to his experienced eye the red lights which showed that every single squadron had been scrambled, was airborne and committed to the fray. And where, he asked Keith Park, are your reserves? Sir, came the reply, there are none. What followed is history. The tide of the battle, which raged from July to the end of October, was turned. And this morning in Westminster Abbey, Her Majesty attended the 50th anniversary service of Thanksgiving. Her Majesty is accompanied by the Dean of Westminster, the very Reverend Michael Main, who will conduct the service. We are gathered here in the presence of God to remember those who died in the Battle of Britain, to give thanks for the freedom which was then preserved for us, to affirm our determination to put an end to all armed conflicts and our penitence for the suffering and destruction they have caused, to pray for the Royal Air Force, that its power and skill may be used to safeguard justice and peace, and for ourselves, that we may hold courageously to the values we profess and work untiringly for the establishment of God's reign on earth. And now the ceremony which takes place each year at the Battle of Britain service. The Book of Remembrance is borne to the altar by a young flying officer. In it, 1,495 names of those killed in action, reported missing, or who failed to return. The lost comrades 
of those who now follow the book, veterans from the United Kingdom and overseas. Many of you listening or watching this service will not remember the Battle of Britain. A young clergyman recently confessed to me that he was puzzled that the Battle of Britain needed a separate remembrance. Wasn't Mem Remembrance Sunday sufficient? I think not. The Battle of Britain deserves a special place in our country's memory. It is not associated with the name of a single great leader like Nelson or Wellington, nor with a great army or great navy. It was a victory of the dedicated few acting selflessly on behalf of us. Newman, a great spiritual giant of the last century, once said, deliverance is wrought not by the many, but by the few, not by bodies, but by persons. Christians should know this truth. There were few disciples at the cross of Jesus. There were few to receive the gift of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It only needs a few determined people to raise a community. It only needs a few of the wrong sort to corrupt it. Today, we give thanks for a time when it was not a community that was raised, but a whole nation. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. We do not sentimentalize those who died in the Battle of Britain if we salute them with those words of our Lord. We do not romanticize those who are still with us, who fought then and were ready to die. We simply remember with the deepest thanksgiving what those few gave and did for us and to remember them with those words of our Lord reminds us that all that is good and virtuous in this world finds its origin in God and that nothing in this world or beyond it neither life nor death can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord and in him whatever comes we are more than conquerors thanks be to God Amen Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is uncertain. He gives power to the faint 
and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not fall. We have seen the commemoration of great events, important not only because we, the British people, made them happen, but also because they shaped the path of world history in which we live today. And in thinking of those who, 50 years on, are no longer with us except in spirit, a slight paraphrase of a poet of the time may be forgiven. Soaring high above the clouds, they put out their hands and touched the face of God. Oh.